twitch.tv slash inside participate. My name is Mike Washburn. I'm the director of engagement for participate. And we've been streaming uh, educational tools, some game-based learning content. Uh, and we're really thrilled to add uh, some, some more content to the stream this week and for the next few weeks. And we're introducing um, this initiative today uh, called the U.S. Challenge. I, I have with me on the stream uh, Mr. Amir Zarkesh. He is the, in charge of uh, the PolyUp. And I have Mr. Alan November with me. Welcome to the live stream, uh, gentlemen. Thank you for having us. Very Thanks, excited. Very Thanks. excited to have um, have you both uh, with me. Um, you know, we have a, a, a there's a lot of conversations happening in a lot of different places and a lot of different outlets and mediums. Uh, I host a, a podcast and we've been talking about uh, a lot of things there related to uh, COVID-19 and, and, and how this is affecting education and um, and it, at participate in particular, we're definitely looking towards the future as well. What, happens after um, we go back into the world and, and into the classrooms and and we're able to heaven forbid leave our homes for more than a few minutes at a time and I think that um, there's a lot of questions that we um, need to answer and I'm I'm really interested Alan in in your take on kind of the impact on this both like the macro and the uh, and the 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 the, the you know, this day to day kind of stuff, but what is this going to look like even when we go back to school? It's, it's not going away anytime soon. Am I right? Well, medically, I can't speak to that, but right. let's just say it's a mess. Yeah. And uh, we don't know what we don't know is all we know. <laughs> so in, in, in fact, I had a call this morning with educators from all over the world, leaders of schools and their sense is, in any case, some teacher's son is going to get COVID-19 in September and the teacher will be quarantined for 14 days. And that's going to happen more and more. I think we're going to see minimally, even if we all go back to our normal schedules, which would be an extreme. But if that's the case, we're going to see a lot of absences of teachers and students. So given that, we're going to have to be incredibly flexible about how we help support both the adults in schools and the kids in schools. Uh, and my sense is, because I happen to be a big fan of Polio, that when you look at emerging tools and you take them from the perspective of this crisis, what I think it means is an incredible opportunity to rethink the role of the learner and the role of the teacher to be much more actively engaged in focused content. So for example, the bells aren't ringing. We're not setting our books aside for a quiz anymore. Maybe even high stakes testing goes away as it has now. And all of a sudden we can give kids hours to focus. Now I know that sounds weird because a lot of kids won't pay attention for 10 minutes, hmm. but that's in a classroom where that one teacher is trying to hold 25 kids' attention. If you had an environment like PolyUp where kids are getting immediate feedback and they feel a sense of an ownership of their work and it's a game and they're learning and they're with friends and they're excited and they're not being marked down because they got something wrong, but they can immediately course correct, you know, mastery learning as a concept, I can't wait for that to happen. Right. It, it's actually a, a really interesting opportunity to to reframe um, some of the things that, that we've done in the past. That, like like the idea that um, high stakes testing um, has been canceled, like, you know, virtually yeah. everywhere. I live in Ontario, Canada, and we did the same thing here canceling canceling our um standardized testing as well and i i think most most educators think of that as as a good thing um and you know this idea that we have these these uh, this opportunity uh, i'm curious um you know what are the repercussions in your mind alan for what yeah. happens if um 
you know, what happens when we come back to school in, in September? Let's say, let's say we come back to school in September, hypothetically, in a, right. in a ideal situation. What do you think our students are going to look like in terms of their, you know, what they've learned from the last few months and uh, what is maybe a worst case scenario or, or a reality uh, check at least uh, of what, what we're kind of facing in September with our students and their knowledge acquisition over the last few months? Right. Well, you know, the worst case scenario is really bad. Yeah. Um, and I've been having conversations with Amir and others. And it looks like when a lot of kids are home, we have a lot of homes that are not conducive to learning. You know, I mean, it's not conducive to getting breakfast and lunch. And, and so if you add up the nutrition loss, and I'm not exaggerating, and you add in the emotional support loss of friends and a caring teacher and a school nurse, it's really not good. It's a lot of anxiety, a lot of failure, a lot of uh, how do I get my life back? It's it's a sad situation in the worst mm -hmm. case. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's what you wanted to hear. No, that's I mean case, the truth. I think the bad. truth is important for sure. Worst case is very bad. The worst case is it seems to be very bad, um, and and so, you know. Uh, uh, Amir, we're working, um, we're here today, and I'm pretty excited to announce um, what we're going to be doing over the next little while. Um, why don't you go ahead, and because uh, Alan has already mentioned PolyUp, why don't you go ahead and introduce PolyUp and, and what PolyUp is and, and what it does, and then we'll get into um, what we're introducing today. Sure, very, very happy to be here. Alan, great to see you again. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, we PolyUp really uh, got started quite a few years ago. Um, it was about uh, 2015, actually, that uh, Professor Tabesh, which was in Stanford, uh, was looking for uh, bringing creative problem solving uh, to, to masses in an equitable fashion. Uh, and, uh, you know, there was actually, they were writing a book about uh, uh, problem solving in an experimental environment, the way that the kids discover their own knowledge. And uh, at that time, um, uh, Professor Tabesh was uh, looking for somebody that is like a native English and knows math and kind of refined the book. And I introduced uh, a ninth grader to him and uh, they kind of hooked. Uh, he's the ninth grader, Shaya was very... Uh, top-notch math student, they hooked, and uh, the prof said, you know, what I want is I want to have an environment that is actually interactive. Books are not the best way to bring creative problem solving. And um, as a result of that, actually, that was kind of a start of this movement, really started from a math teacher and a math student. And uh, it went through quite a few number of iterations, you know, the, the kind of four generation of the prototypes have came out. It has been tested in many uh, classrooms in North and Southern California until kind of last year, uh, around January, that finally the fourth generation actually seems to address some of the main issues that you need to bring creative problem solving. I mean, we all know math games, you know, games to do uh, fifth grade arithmetic or seventh grade uh, geometry or ninth grade, uh, you know, uh, um, um, say uh, calculus or, and, and the issue is that there hasn't been a cohesive environment to be able to scale, to be able to have an activity that the, the student itself become an active learner, an active partner to be able to, to make, uh, uh, the, make the uh, environment and go forward. That was the main idea. And through this iteration, actually, an environment came along uh, and it's kind of last year when it come out, it's really like a movement got into like 70 countries through the teachers and, uh, and the students. And during last year, there has been a lot of input, there's a pouring of effort through teachers and the students on how they want to get, to get evolved. And as a result, something came about, which is now in a 3D environment. And actually kids can build uh, robots and drones and cities, which everything come to life in it in a context of math. 
So, so that that's kind of the pedagogy or or, or the uh, basic of how this came together. We are losing your voice. And so Polyup has come together and and kind of is leading the charge on a new initiative, uh, Amir, called the U.S. Challenge. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the actual, the U.S. Challenge, um, what it is and why it's here and why it's important, because I think all of those things are really great things to talk about right now. Uh, fantastic. So, uh, you know, uh, before the COVID-19 happened, uh, we have seen there has been a kind of national move in various countries about how to bring an active learner environment uh, to, the class, uh, to the classroom. And, uh, and the way that, that people usually do this is they think about this kind of environment or environment that you have to bring as a new classroom, a coding classroom, a robotics, an after school program. And usually that effort has been not equitable and accessible. Uh, so what we have seen as, as this kind of, uh, kind of organically has happened is because the language that is getting used here is the language of math, actually there is an opportunity to bring this to the math classroom. You know, every uh, school, every grade, uh, at every country, even if they have a temporary building for school, they still have an hour of math. Mm -hmm. So it becomes very scalable and equitable if you can bring such an environment in a language is not a coding language; is a language of math, such that and and is directly related to the curriculum, such that the math teachers can do. So this happened in uh, in some of the other countries at a national level. But before COVID, here in US, there were some organizations that work and put some kind of challenges. There there was an AVI challenge. There was Stanford challenge. Stanford YouTube has put its own challenge. So. It was great. There were a lot of students get involved. A lot of teacher got involved. A lot of activity happened, but we never had a national move. And unfortunately, due to a disaster or uh, such a huge challenge, now what happened is various organizations have come together, and there is a sense of urgency for how to make sure the students by the September, however the classrooms look like, and however we go back they actually don't lose the year they had. And now this has become the kind of in past just three weeks. It's just amazing how fast things that could happen in like 10 years before COVID-19 happened in three weeks. In three weeks, a set of national organizations have come together and put their forces behind bringing this environment, the U.S. challenge, which actually belongs to all these organizations, and all teachers and students across U.S., to revitalize the 2019-20 school year from first to eighth grade math. It's exciting. Why don't you take us through the program a little bit? Um, we, we're showing we're showing the U.S. Challenge website. Great website put together uh, really, really well, and it's got a lot of great information on it. So why don't you share some of that information with us? Uh, sure. So so what, what you see in the video actually is a set of activities that is happening on in the environment I and mean, uh, th this is like uh, everything you see is actually done by a students and teacher none of the content that you see or the animations you see none of them done curated outside it's actually by the community for the community and then everything is open source of course and, and freely available to all and um, this u.s challenge has come together to bring a 12-week program and the idea behind this really has been uh, from an observation uh, of um, a, a main gap and issue that is happening in, in U.S. Ed education. So I, I want to just show this, Kerem, and, and actually is, is for our, us has been kind of quite uh, uh, eye-opening uh, after looking into the data with the, with the partners that are working on this that if you look at the a student in third grade, uh, say in summer of 19, last summer, uh, the, there is a disparity, a significant disparity between high socioeconomic status of students and low socioeconomic status of students. So I would call them H and L here. And the data shows, there are many studies and, and you, can, you can go through them, that for the, uh, for the H, for the high socioeconomic status of students, 
they usually by end of the third grade they're at the grade equivalent to third grade and and then through the summer uh, there is a differentiation happens. Usually the low socioeconomic students at the end of the third grade were actually at about 1.8 uh, grade equivalent level. And this gap that exists, it gets exasperated by the summer. So you see that usually the data shows about 10% increase happens for age through the summer because of many classes and summer activities they go and a decrease of about 15% on average happens because they don't have activity. Mm -hmm. And then this kind of increases the gap. And that's why as you go through grade by grade, actually, when you get to the middle school, the gap becomes so huge. One of the reasons actually the summer effect. And the, the issue is that the, this effect through COVID now got significantly amplified. So if there wasn't a COVID, the, the, the increase in, in the low socioeconomic status of students will go up and then they go to the next year. And the data shows by end of fifth grade in US on average, there is a gap of about twice, fifth, fifth grade level versus about two and a half. But now, because now you have artificial longer summer, the COVID closure of the schools, right. you have a significant time that nothing happening in the schools that there is online program is not there. The students don't have access to internet or uh, the, the program's not in place. That causes this decrease to actually, by end of their fifth grade next year, this is now estimate, is going to add something roughly around one third of the grade actually decrease. This means that we systemically are going to get, see an increase of the gap because that the, the high socioeconomic status uh, students uh, invariably they see the online activities and they catch up back to where they were. So we're definitely seeing a loss of of retention, a loss of uh, of learning, uh, uh, certainly also a loss in opportunity to have you know one on one and personalized instruction uh, with teachers as well. Those are all kind of problems that we're we're definitely seeing and and so. You know how is the how is the U.S. challenge responding to some of those issues? Then, so you know what what we are seeing is there are different elements that teacher bring to the classroom, and 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 you need to have to make this happen. Bottom line is we are using summertime. They're exactly the time that you see the decrease in usual years. We want to leverage that as an opportunity between May and August to have this, uh, uh, this kind of intervention. And uh, what, uh, what has been seen is uh, the, the elements that right now are missing, say if there was even a, a school exists between May and August, the elements that teachers come, like really the list is, of course, the teachers bring the, uh, you know, the lectures and the concept, the teachers bring the pacing, you know, what you do this week, what you do next week, the teachers bring activities and feedback on activities. And uh, of course, more basic things like what, what Alan mentioned, you know, some of them, they bring lunch to them, which, which is, exists there. Of course, that's, that's something that has to be addressed differently. In US Challenge, how these elements come together is the element of the lecture is comes from online resources like Khan Academy videos. The, le the element of pacing comes from the platform that it paces the students every week through a set of uh, a set of concepts. And if you go here in the site right now, see the 12 week program, you see that every week through the 12 weeks, students will have a set of activities which are engaging about the concepts in either in 3D environment, but directly linked to the Common Core program for the first to eighth grade. They have those activities. They have, uh, you know, they have the videos which are uh, related to the concept. So that's kind of a flipped classroom, meaning that they get a lecture outside and they come to the classroom for the activities. And then various partners are doing amazing work here. For example, the content of the Common Core is coming by teachers from Q, computer user educators, which are an amazing organization in California and Nevada for the educators that are familiar with use of technology in the classroom. They have put the content together 
And as you see from first grade to eighth grade, each week in from May 18 all the way to the August 10, different concept of the Common Core is going to be covered by a set of interactive engaging activities. And it gives the pacing to them. So the pacing is there. Every week, the, the lectures would be the videos that are going to be available corresponding to the week. So that's the other piece. The, the third piece is the activity itself to kind of quote unquote grading. But here is not a grading, it's just two activities like more gamified. They get points. So the pacing is there through the subject you see. And the last piece is that coaching that the teachers can provide. And the teachers have their own training every week that, that, that this is going to become by national organizations that, that, that work on the teacher training at, at masses. They're going to bring the opportunity to train the teachers such that they can get engaged. And at the end, parents are going to be involved. There is going to be participate. Another organization which is having a great work with the, with the US Challenge is going to have weekly sessions for parents on how to guide and coach their children through the activities every week. So we're touching on uh, so a a grade one to eight math kind of program here with uh, twelve weeks of content. It looks amazing with outreach to teachers, students, and parents. Uh, and you know the parents being a, an incredibly important aspect of of this type of program since they're the ones that are at home with their kids right now um definitely going to need to guide parents along uh i just want to clarify is there any cost to the students and parents to to use this so th that's the amazing part that uh, uh, you know the uh, uh, national emergency and unity brings in there are many companies right now that are putting their support for the US challenge mm -hmm. and they are enabling the whole thing is free for everybody free for everybody and you know I mean I have a news for you to tell actually yesterday we had one discussion that this the infrastructure that's provided for this for free is going to support this school to up to 20 million students across the country it's incredible so it's free for everybody and it's uh it, it looks uh pretty robust in terms of the content that it's covered um amir how is it how is it different than you know there's a lot of people doing a lot of online learning remote learning remote teaching stuff everywhere uh i mean even on on this twitch stream we've been doing kind of professional development type stuff teaching teachers how to use uh, tons of different like technology tools and, and things like that. So, so how is this different? What differentiates this with, you know, lots of other things going on? Well, I, I think, you know, uh, the, the main point I can say is only two words. One is active learning and the other one is personalization. So the, there are a lot of amazing, fantastic content, curated content from K to 12 on the net free and, 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 and uh, you know, a lot of effort, great efforts putting on that. The issue is that we have a one, one sided stream. There is a teacher that's saying what to do and there's a fixed set of problems that the students do. Here, you make this upside down. You make the, the students become active learner. So every week, not only there are activities that they do about say division decimals, they can, they can build machines, we call them machines, is, is an environment like you see. These, these are all machines. Mm -hmm. And every movement happens by math. There is nothing other than math gets used there. The children, the students build the machines about the subject and share. And those machines randomly will be shown to other students that if they play, they get points and they actually, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down. And every week there is an amalgam of top machines that getting shown. So the main fundamental difference is the learner actually builds the problem rather than solving a curated problem, giving to them. But at the same time, that's happened to be sit next to the content, which is Krukrum Align. Really, that's, that's missing link. 
Sure. And uh, Amir, there's actually a great question from the chat that I'll ask now because I think it's good. What about kids who are not on grade level for whatever reason? Would an eighth grade student do the eighth grade program no matter what? Or are they able to do the curriculum, the content from grade seven, for example? Or would a grade five student, for example, be able to do the grade seven content if, if they wanted to? Fantastic question. So we had two elements, active learning and personalization. So that goes back to personalization. So what happens is, this is again uh, the advantage of a platform like this. Every week, there are going to be a set of great activity provided like these four machines is about multiplication. But at the same week, and, and they have high mark, they have like maybe 10x points. But at the same week, there are machines which are fun machines. There are machines which are harder, which we don't say higher grade. We just say they're harder, but actually from higher grade. There are machines from lower grade. You are, you are in, in like eighth grade and you don't have the fundamentals of fifth grade right. You just see it as easier machines, not as fifth grade machines. And that is enabled to scaffold across the students, go from mm -hmm. one grade to another. And, and I really want to get view of Alan because Alan knows this much better than we know that what's the impact of this environment. Alan, if you can, you can talk a little bit about this, really appreciate it. So that's a great question uh, because in any classroom, you do have kids separated by grades. That's just the reality every day. So I love the question. Um, with Polya, you can, you can go back as far as you want. You can also go ahead as far as you want. So the environment is really bigger than, than up to eighth grade. It just keeps going to calculus and beyond. Right. And, and it's amazing to me, why would you overestimate a student's creativity and inventiveness if they don't know basic math, right? That today I was just reading about Stephen Wolfram who uh, created an amazing company called Wolfram Research, and he has Wolfram Alpha, the knowledge engine. He only you learned the math tables, multiplication tables in his 40s, but he wrote physics papers based on mathematical concepts when he was 15, but he didn't know the math. Einstein flunked math. Mm. So the reality of what we've done with mathematics is that we hold kids back from applying their imagination unless they know the basics of math. What Polyev does, it says, frankly, we're not worried about that. What we're worried about is kids' imagination and their willingness to stick with a design problem until they get it right. And because Polyev gives immediate feedback to the learner, it either works or it doesn't work. With no punishment, you don't get a C or a D or an F, you just get information about what doesn't work mm -hmm. and then you can fix it on your own. So you own your learning. So I think what's going to happen is we're going to see kids who historically have not done well in math, but have great imaginations go past any expectation many teachers currently have I, and their parents. I, I love the idea of reframing math, uh, as as a as a computational thinking yes a, a process and as a as an iterative process thing instead of um you know the way that i took math and i hated math and and right. like mike washburn is not good at math but i was i'm definitely a decent kind of coder a decent block coder yeah. um and i could wrap my head around python um so I, I get like the computational thinking, iterative design thing, and I'm fine with the idea of making mistakes and not getting things right the first time. And so when you balance those, those, th that side with math, which I, you know, hated as a kid, um, right. I, I definitely understand right. it was now as an educator, I understand it was the way I was taught, not, not that I hated math or that I'm bad at math. Um, uh, this, solves a lot of those problems that you know that 13 year old mike washburn would have had um with with learning math for sure 
Um, I I love the the um, the 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 less punitive punitive. I don't know if that's a real word or not, but I'm making it up now. Uh, and, and you know, um, more iterative approach to learning math in a fun way and in a playful way, which is what I think PolyUp does. Absolutely. Awesome. And a collaborative too. I mean, I've yeah. watched, I've watched two or three kids huddled over one computer screen who are nice to each other, <laughs> who not? encouraging and helping and yeah. saying, well, what if we move it to over here? And what if we add, you know, a bit here? And the other kids listen because they're all trying to figure this out together. So not only does it teach you, you know, tap in your imagination, mathematics, mm -hmm. you're also learning collaboration and yeah. you're learning problem solving. It's a yeah. lot of things in one place. Those 21st yeah. century skills that we keep talking about, uh, pretty pretty live uh, and in play here. Yeah. Uh, Amir, why don't you show us a little bit uh, of the platform itself? Because I think that there's a lot of people, including myself, who are just kind of learning about the platform uh, over the last couple of weeks uh, and would be interested in actually seeing it in action a little bit. Uh, why, why don't you take us through a little bit of that? Fantastic. So uh, let me let me show you an example here uh, that uh, is like is a bionic hand, for example. So uh, what what you see here is you see actually a 3D hand, and you know it seems kind of impressive the first time that the kids see it. They say, "Wow!" And they you know how do you do that? You know probably some adult in engineer has done it. And when you give it to them, you see that they build this rapidly. How these kids build this from uh, uh, you know, a set of, uh, you know, just a uh, very simple uh, set of objects that they uh, they get uh, snapped together and you can build, you can build this kind of a hand. You can build this hand in about a matter of two, three minutes, any kid, and, and, and you know, they, they, they do it faster than, than we can do. This is, a, this is their role. They know how to bring pieces together, snap it together, and there are all sorts of libraries. And, and these libraries that you see here, actually, for example, UQ from Stanford has a library here that, that is a library for 2D shapes and, and, and all sorts of various shapes. They get connected to each other. I can, I can make this, you know, like, for example, more of it. I can bring more, uh, more here and connect them together. So, so it's, 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 a, it's an environment which is they, their kind of a world. They know how to do fast. And now that you put those together, you can move and bring into life with math. So let me show you what happens here. So you see that you, the, the hand is actually make a fist here. And for the kids, I can tell you like, you know, experiences we have seen like in fourth grade that they, they teach uh, angles. After 25 minutes that the teacher has talked about the angles, you know, what's the right angle, what's 360 degree around uh, for, for, for having a full rotation, then they bring this up and they see this movement and the first reaction they have, oh, oh that's cool. Hmm. How can I do that? And in the environment that we used to that, oh, there has to be coding classroom and I don't need to know Python or Java or I have to go after school program. The idea is, OK, this is not in the math classroom. I should do it outside. But what happens is then the teacher tells, you know, you know, this is actually based on some very simple thing we just talked about. Each piece has a chip on it, just like I can put a chip on this and I can go inside that chip and I can start to move it around. So mm -hmm. if I go here and I got I just say uh, very simply uh, to let me actually put it in a uh, in a form that is simple and the kids see I had all the uh, all the advanced mode in. I go to casual, which are regular uh, students see. If I go here, I see that the, what I have is as simple as I can have two and go forward, for example and then rotate as much as, for example, uh, 45 degree. And I can do this again and again. again I can say that whenever, uh, whenever you get at the end, do this again, I put this here. So I come down, it's to go forward, 45 degree turn. And oh, I have the same column again happens to go forward 45 degree turn. This is the way that kids in math classroom 
discover loop. They don't need to go to a block coding. It just learn it in context of math and, and the operations that they can do there. Now, I can have any operation. I can have like, you can have multiply two by two. And here the only difference is the multiplication is after the kids learn that fast. So you see visually two times two is four. I go for a step forward, 45 degree turn. And when I go back to the environment, I see that this happens on the object. So the object right now going forward, 45 degree turn. You see every time 45 degree turn and go forward. So I, these... I won't lie, Amir. I've never seen a website animated so beautifully. I, I props to your programmers, the, the your web coders, because those actions, those just those coding blocks and the way they're animated, I find it's it's absolutely gorgeous. It'd be engaging for kids. So like I used to talk, I talk all the time about aesthetics and how if you're teaching kids, the way things look matters. It matters to kids. It's it's why you know game based, and I'm a games based learning educator, and so like I talk a lot about like why kids really want to play like Minecraft instead of these like games made by textbook companies and stuff like that, because the way it looks matters. And I'll tell you, the, the aesthetics of this are, are, are really cool. And, and I think that kids gravitate to that sort of thing. So I, I love this. And, and, and you see now, now what happened is, oh, actually, let me do this. If I, if I put this one, if I take this out and then put this connect to this, now it actually moves together. And you see now you can see the drawing of the uh, uh, you know shape and you know this is a 3d environment but if i look it from the top i can see the hey, octagon yeah. correct and not now now that you see how this works i want to go back and show thousands of line of code that you wrote to make this hand which is what the feeling is but if you go back you will see that each of this chip really has only 55 degree and turn that's the code you have there is an angle. The next one is 45 degree turn. The next one is 30 degree turn. So the only thing the kids need to do is they need to wash their hand and see from this position to turn it to have the feast, each part of their hand, how much degrees rotates. <laughs> In the first session that they learn angle, instead of being bored and thinking, what, why the hell I'm learning this on the board? They yeah. say, man, by knowing an angle, I could do a hand move. What can I do next? What else do you have here? And this is where the math become empowerment to do robotics at zero cost for every kid that has low bandwidth connection in a cheap mobile device. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing, and and it's um, like I said, I, I think I think it's great that even you know even just talking about the interface opens up a whole world of conversation uh, about like three like X Y Z axis, uh, and you know what I would connect it to is again um, you know games like Minecraft that have X Y Z axis in them as well. Uh, our kids are starting to learn um you know geometric axis and 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 xyz and all this stuff from from things like man i wish i had this when i was a kid because uh because that i, I would have learned it so much better it's it's really it's really quite something uh to uh to see in action you know and and, and the beauty is that what what is the hardest part is to have an environment that the floor is low yeah Okay, that, that's where you talk. So we, we have examples that you have uh, actually, you know, uh, I have to go uh, and, and, and find some to show you. I, I didn't think that this uh, would be a good time to show it, but I can show you that a first grader talk about moving a dinosaur can understand that the one plus two means dinosaur went over three step forward. Right. Okay. Right. So well, when you're saying low floor, I mean, yeah, like you can you can have a block move in a square. Yes. Uh, and that's like that's like the epitome of low floor. I mean, you can have and, and kids would love that, especially like I taught coding to grade twos and I could get my grade twos to do do something like that. Um, 
So uh, there's okay. someone in the comments, and Alan, you'll appreciate this. This must be in line with Alan's mantra of don't turn it in, publish it, as kids are able to share poly up machines with peers to modify. What do you think of that, Alan? Oh, you're muted, Alan. <laughs> That's right. I am muted. Um, yeah, my sense is most kids have an audience of one. It's their teacher. And when when you invite kids to publish their work for other kids, yeah, their curiosity about what other kids think is yes. sometimes more motivating to work on a project than for a grade. Yep. And yeah, so my, my, my agency sense, is is huge. Oh, it is. So what Polyap has done is they've made this incredible global community on their website for kids to uh, publish their work. And then uh, they can see how other kids play their games. It's incredibly motivating. Awesome. I think I think Amir's got something else to show us. I'm excited about this one. Look at this. So now you're okay. talking about the low floor. I mean, first of all, I want to I want to say this loud and clear. You know, we met Alan a couple of years ago first in in uh, in ISTE, and man, from there, what we're doing is really he had a list of like six items about what a, a good learning environment should be. So we are still trying to get check marks of those six. So Alan, you rock and really appreciate that. It's still that's the kind of a like a uh, beacon light for us to follow. So here is one of those that you see that low floor. We are talking about some kids that need to come here and, you know, hit this uh, pole and then hit the other pole. And, and, and it's as simple as uh, you, you run, you run uh, this, uh, you go here inside the, here it says, please have the Dinobot get here, here go inside. And these are the simple maths that you have to put that, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, you have 90 times 20, 6 times 2, and here you have a division. And each of these elements runs one of those. And when you go back and you start to run it, you actually see the Dinobot is doing the right thing uh, for, for moving and turning. So this is the side of the low floor. You're talking about kindergarten, first grade, type of environment and man, kids love it. They build this from simple items. Now, this is one end of a spectrum. And what I wanna show you now is the other side of the spectrum. Let's, let's talk about, for example, a, a ninth grader. Mm -hmm. And in the case of ninth grade, uh, or you're talking about they know now uh, the, um, uh, they know the, uh, say, trigonometry. And, and with just knowing trigonometry, what they can do is they can do uh, a model of a figure skater. And now I'm talking about having no ceiling, not high ceiling, no ceiling, because you're talking about an environment which is uh, uh, you know, technically Turing complete, meaning that there's no limit. It brings system thinking. And here you have a ninth grader built a humanoid that does figure skating. And here you can just watch the movement. So just watch how the harmonic movement happened between the hand, feet, head, and also richness of the moving around. And you know, I've sh you know I, this one we have shown to many experts in programming and block coding and and Python programmers. And the question I always ask is, you know, how many lines of codes needed to write this? How many do you have to write in Unity on Unreal or other environment to do something like this? And the answers are invariably between like five, 600 lines to 2,000 lines of code. Assuming that you don't have any library, correct? This is the basic. You start from scratch. And the power comes that when you have math and when you have an environment that system thinking comes, is not about writing a lot of line of code. It's about making a complex behavior for a system by carefully design every element of the system to do a simple behavior, but coordinated behavior. And that system thinking is missing in schools, even for those that they learn coding. And here, if we go to one of these chips, you see the only thing is there is one line, which is says time pi times pi t, cosine of pi t, 1.2 times, and rotate. And this even 
is visual. If time is zero, pi times zero is zero, cosine of zero is one, and and one point two times one is one. This simple function gets repeated in twelve chips. Some of them have sine, some of them have cosine, and as a result, you achieve a system level goal, which looks wow, so cool. Okay, it's very cool. So. This is this is great. Um, you're getting a lot of fans in the chat, um, folks that are pretty impressed with the platform, and and I think we're really excited um, to get started uh, on on the U.S. challenge. I think it's going to fill a, a a really big gap, as Alan has talked about, and and kind of meet uh, a lot of the needs um, that we have going forward. Um, so I want to remind everybody, uh, so this is a 12-week program that's beginning in the middle of May. What was that first date, Amir? May 18th. May 18th. Um, and we are uh, running streams here on twitch.tv slash inside participate, the, the participate uh, live streaming channel uh, for the next three weeks leading up to the beginning of that event. So, and then every week during the event. So, uh, so 15 more weeks of streaming one hour, uh, right at this time. So, so I believe it's, it's going to be at this time. If it's not, we'll let you know, but, uh, for the first little while, it's going to be here Thursdays at 2 PM Eastern time. And we're, we're gonna, we're gonna dive into this. We're going to take a look at the platform. We're going to talk about how it's used. We're going to talk about how to, uh, how to frame all of this content uh, that we're looking at and, and deliver it to, to these kids and, and get them really excited about learning math and computational thinking. And, uh, there was someone in the chat that brought up, uh, the idea that you could do narrative design. You could, you could you could tell stories with with Polly up and so now we're talking about like language learning and math learning and computer science learning all in kind of the same uh, the same place in a really kind of fun way so it's it, it's pretty exciting stuff and I'm excited to be a part of it at participate the one thing that I'll remind everybody who's watching uh, if you're watching live on Twitch which is where you should be watching um, if you click on the heart at the top of the screen in the interface that'll get you following us on uh on the on the stream so you'll get a notification every time we go live so not only will you be notified when we go live uh for the u.s challenge but we actually do uh, quite a bit of other great content in uh in the twitch stream uh including the actually next so in the next 10 minutes we're going to be starting the gone home game study uh we do uh we do a deep dive into a video game uh series and and talk about how we use it for teaching and learning. So that's next on the stream. And we do a lot of other stuff. So um, please be notified when it comes out by by following the stream on Twitch. So you get that notification uh, and that you don't miss you don't miss it. Uh, I want to make sure everyone follows uh, all of us all on Twitter as well. Um, uh, at uh, what's what's Polyup's uh, Twitter handle, Amir? It is uh, Polyup Inc. At Polly Up Inc. and I'm at Mr. Washburn. You can also follow at Participate. And Alan, how do people uh, how do people connect with you on on Twitter? Global Earner. Global Earner. I just uh, on Twitter. It. It's supposed to be Global Learner, but I didn't put in the second L. So, <laughs> so it turned out to be Global Earner. Which is funny because I noticed that today when I was tweeting, uh, tagging you in a tweet, I was I, I instinctually did two L's and went, oh, right. that's not right. Yeah. Uh, and I did not want to mess it up. Um, so Mike, can I, can I have a, a request from the fantastic audience here, uh, yeah. if I may? Is that okay? So the, the, the two points I want to mention. One, yes. this is not only PolyUp. I want to emphasize there are amazing organizations are helping yeah. on this. Content comes from teachers. Uh, November Learning is helping. You know, Q is helping. Uh, participants. It's, it's just and it's growing. Please join the. This is a movement. It's not shiny product. It's an experiment to deal with a with a emergency. And if the experiment goes well, this becomes something that it will get used more and more. Mm -hmm. So the request is: please consider this as your own. It's going to be flawed. It's going to need to get better. And the only way it gets better is because the students, teachers, and parents, and the partners, they all put their they chip in and make it happen. 
So Same. please, please uh, participate. Fantastic. Yes. Um, Alan, thank you so much for joining us on the stream oh, this honor. afternoon. This was great. Amir, thank you so much for joining us as well. And uh, thank everybody for watching. We had quite a few viewers uh, watching the stream. A lot of great conversation. Um, please uh, check out the, the website. What's the website, Amir? Let's make sure we get everyone the website. Is uschallenge.org. Uschallenge.org. I will put it in the chat so people can literally just click on it. Um, super easy to do. Uh, go there um, and, and bookmark that because you're going to be on it uh, quite a bit over the next uh, 15 weeks or so. Thanks, everyone, for watching, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye now. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Alan. Oh, an honor.